Hey guys, what is going on? Professor Tomney here from Chem Complete Online, and I am here to bring you the rest of the SN1 lecture today. So let's go ahead and bring up our previous information and our digital whiteboard. I'm going to recap what we've talked about in terms of SN1 so far, and then we will finish off the rest of this lecture. This will complete all of the analysis for the substitution portion of Organic 1. So if you stay tuned after this, since we've covered SN2 and, uh, and SN1, we will go through some practice problems. All right. So remember, SN1, the 1 stands for unimolecular. We are waiting for the leaving group to leave. A carbocation forms before the nucleophile is going to come in. In terms of ranking, We've got benzylic, allylic, and tertiary are very, very good options. Secondary is an okay option. And then we have primary, methyl, and vanillic. Those are not good options for forming carbocations. This is based on electronic stability, the stability of the carbocations. We are not making steric arguments here like we did in the SN2 situation. So after that, we take a look at the identity of the leaving group. Uh, again, this followed the same trend that we saw in SN2. So the tosylate is the supreme leaving group because it has the resonance stability when it leaves in solution. Then we have iodine, bromine, chlorine. The other ones, because they're strong bases in solution, would not make good leaving groups unless they're protonated and they leave in a neutral form. We talked about the choice of nucleophile, right? So we've gone through this in almost every single lecture so far. Remember that SN1, we tend to use mild neutral nucleophiles. Not that you couldn't use a charged one, but it's more uh, preferable, so to speak, um, to use a mild neutral nucleophile. And just a note as we're getting down here to solvent, many times the solvent and the nucleophile will be one and the same when we're talking about that. And so you may hear the term solvolysis, okay? Solvolysis refers to when I double up my solvent and my nucleophile as the same compound. So for instance, water, we'll do an example where we see that. So the choice of solvent, when we get ready to do solvent choice for an SN1 reaction, we would prefer use a polar protic solvent. So we're not going to discuss this in a whole lot of detail in terms of what makes a polar protic solvent because we did discuss it in the SN2 lectures. Go back to those if you have any issues with this. But polar protic is the preferred solvent for an SN1, and let's take a look at why. So if we come over to the whiteboard, if we have a polar protic solvent, remember a polar protic solvent is something that has a hydrogen bound to an oxygen or to a nitrogen, right? So if I find either of these present in my solvent, I have a protic solvent. Now by the very nature of these bonds, this is also going to be polar, so we do want to include polar. Remember when we were talking about SN2, we need a polar solvent because we have to be able to solubilize, like dissolves like, we have to be able to solubilize the nucleophiles as well as the um, alkyl halides that contain the leaving groups, or the alkyl tosylates. So when we have polar protic, all right, keep in mind, so let's take a, let's take a look at a, a tertiary because we know tertiaries make good SN1 conditions, right? So I've got something like this. We'll use iodine as the leaving group, and then we'll use H2O. H2O will be both the solvent and the nucleophile in this case, okay? So some other polar protic solvents might be methanol or ethanol. You could use your alcohols, right? So any type of ROH. If you can find any type of amine group, uh, so it doesn't have to be a primary amine, it could be a secondary amine, but any type of amine group could also work, uh, provided it's in liquid form. But uh, water is another one, right? Anytime you can come up with compounds that have these types of bonds, they make good solvents. So what I would end up with here when I finish this SN1 reaction, I would end up with the alcohol. And we talked about that in the general process of the reaction. But let's take a look at what happens here. If water is the nucleophile, water is going to hydrogen bond to itself. And so initially, we may run into the same problem, right? So if this water wanted to be a nucleophile that's going to attempt to come into this carbon once it becomes a carbocation, it seems like, okay, well, 
the water is going to hydrogen bond with other waters, which would stabilize it. It's going to lower the energy of this nucleophile, right? And that is true. That's going to happen. We are going to, through these hydrogen bonds, sort of lower the energy associated with water as a nucleophile. But in that case, that is not important, right? Because the nucleophile in an SN1 does not participate in the reaction as far as the rate limiting step is concerned. So we certainly need it to do its work once the carbocation forms, but in the rate limiting step, we do not need the nucleophile to be participating. In fact, it's probably better that it be occupied and leave this group alone for the most part until this group gets ready to undergo uh, the leaving process. So if we take a look and we come down, right, as the iodine starts to leave, and I'm drawing this as a transition state here, the iodine starts to leave. We still have the carbon here with its R groups. We're building up a very large partial positive on the carbon and that polarizable iodine gets a very large partial negative charge. At this point, when we have this drastic buildup of charges, now the water is not going to be so concerned about hydrogen bonding to other water molecules as it is going to be concerned with coming to help stabilize this transition state, right? And that is a beneficial thing because when we start to stabilize this transition state, we are going to promote the transition state forming at a better rate in terms of kinetics and it is also going to be stabilizing for the carbocation that's left behind right so the waters start to align themselves to help stabilize this transition state which basically in turn is going to lower the energy of the transition state that first peak right when we look at an energy diagram this first transition state, and actually I shouldn't have drawn it like that, that makes it look like an SN2, because um, you do have additional steps, right? So if we were to erase that, we would have an intermediate, and then we would have another step of some sort like that. But anyway, this transition state, we're going to be able to lower the energy requirements for this to reach the top of this transition state if we have the support of these polar protic interactions as this leaving group is starting to leave, right? But we don't want it to crowd the leaving group until the leaving group has almost left in terms of the transition state. Now, the real beneficial part is that when the leaving group officially leaves, I'm left with a carbocation, right? A formal charge. And now I can really see the benefits of having a polar protic solvent because now these large dipoles can align themselves and they can get involved in hydrogen bonding with the carbocation. On top of that, one of these waters, right, is going to prefer to act as a nucleophile and actually attack the carbocation, right? But the water or any other polar protic solvent is going to be of great assistance in heading through this charged intermediate, this carbocation, right? Remember that in SN2, the nucleophile needs to be up and off the ground in terms of high energy so it can get in as the leaving group is leaving. Here, we have a different scenario where we actually have stabilizing of the carbocation left behind that we wouldn't find in an SN2 reaction. And so therefore, polar protic solvents are favored in SN1, and that's because they help to stabilize The transition state and the carbo anytime I put C dot C it's carbocation and the carbocation that's left behind which will quickly react with nucleophile okay so polar protic excellent choice for SN1 but not for SN2 so keep those uh, differences in mind when you're comparing reactions okay the other thing I wanted to bring up is the product considerations and this is actually a great sort of segue into that which is when we have a carbocation, right, keep in mind when we had the SN2, we didn't have carbocations and we could only have a backside attack. So that led to a 100% inversion, right? So if you keep in mind, let's draw this up here. And in fact, the way I'm going to draw this, let's go ahead and say, right, so here's leaving group X. And then we'll say that we've got 
r prime or r1 whatever you want to call it right and then we've got attached to this uh, let me I, I want to draw this out a little bit further so it's really clear when we're entering this transition state okay there we go all right so the backside attack would normally happen we'll call this one r what do i want to call that r2 and r3 okay so backside attack would normally happen where we come in from the back right during that transition state and these invert. We set 100% inversion of R1, R2, and R3 to the right side of the carbon when that leaving group leaves. But remember, that was because we had to have a backside attack. In this case, we don't have to have a backside attack. In fact, I'm going to hit undo here because that arrow, right, is not going to... How many undos do we have? There we go. That arrow is not going to come in here until the leaving group has left, right? And so the leaving group is going to leave. And what happens once the leaving group leaves is that this goes from sp3 tetrahedral, right? So we'll abbreviate over here, tetrahedral. And we go down to an sp2 carbocation. This is trigonal planar. And the big thing about the trigonal planar is that it is flat. This is very, very important. I know we've talked about this in other lessons, uh, but flat trigonal planar intermediates when we have carbocations you could have nucleophile attack from the front right or the nucleophile could come in and attack from the back because this is flat when we look at this intermediate and because of that if this attacks from the front i'm going to retain my stereochemistry and if i attack from the back just like in an sn2 i'm going to invert my stereochemistry and statistically speaking 50 percent of the time the nucleophile will come in from the front and 50 percent of the time it'll come in from the back so i really get a 50 percent inversion 50 percent retention because of this right so if let me clear this one more time if i end up with let's say uh right so uh, we'll do here's r1 R2, R3, right? And then I have some leaving group X, and I'm going to use water, right? So X will leave, the water will come in, if we're talking about this from a mechanism standpoint. And what I'm going to end up with is, if I'm looking at this, half of the time I'll get a backside attack, and I will invert the stereochemistry involved in this arrangement right so there's an inversion if you take a look at this this is the mirror image right so r1 r2 r3 r1 r2 r3 over here that's 50 percent of the time that would result in coming in from the back but because i'm dealing with trigonal planar i could also come in from the front and if I came in from the front, I would knock those three back into their original position. Uh, whoops, that one should be a dash. R2. Every time I say R2, I think of R2D2, right? R3. And then, boom. I have an inversion. I'm sorry, I have a retention of stereochemistry 50% of the time. And this is a result of an attack from the front. Okay, so in terms of your stereochemical considerations, the outcomes here, whenever I'm dealing with, whoops, whenever I'm dealing with a SN1, I get 50% inversion because I will have backside attacks some of the time, but I will also have a 50% retain or retention of the stereochemistry. So that pretty much takes care of SN1 reactions. Uh, again, big differences here when you're comparing the two. SN2 has different solvent choices, different nucleophiles that are preferred, the charged versus the neutral, and different order of the substituents in terms of the leaving groups. The only thing that really stays consistent is the ranking of the leaving group. So in other words, in SN1 and in SN2, tosylates, iodine, bromine, this number two consideration stays the same between them. 
Other than that, a lot of these are flipped or we make opposite choices, okay? So keep all of this stuff in mind. If you have any questions, feel free to leave comments. Like the video if you found it helpful. Uh, that gives me good feedback. And then please remember to subscribe because I will be updating the channel regularly with information to help you guys get through your tests. Um, I'm here in case you need anything. And I will see you guys for the practice session, which will be the next video. We'll do some practice problems for SN1 and SN2. Um, so I will see you guys then. And thanks for learning with me as always.